Hello and welcome everyone to our um, uh, Tarawat and NYU Abu Dhabi session on family business history. It's our first session after the summer and we hope that everybody had a wonderful time uh, this summer recovering uh, from the first part of the year uh, and it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone back. Thank you very much for your interest. So today's session, we're very excited about it. Um, it's going to be a great conversation, uh, very in-depth and we can't wait to start. But as usual, before we get started, uh, just a couple of um, pieces of information for you. Please feel free to uh, be as interactive as you wish with us. Uh, use the Q&A and the chat functions. Uh, you're most welcome to ask your questions, make your comments. Uh, we know that a lot of you have a particular interest in today's topic, so please feel free to share your insights and your questions. If you have any trouble, please feel free to contact our, our team. We are there to help. And we will let you now, after so many years, I know that everybody knows about Zoom settings, but feel free to adjust your Zoom setting um, to the view that is of uh, the most um, helpful and convenient for you. Before we get started, I wanted to just take a moment to uh, reintroduce our project because uh, we have a lot of new joiners today and I wanted to take the opportunity to just dive in to um, this project that has been going on for a few years now in collaboration between the Tarawat Family Business Forum and New York University Abu Dhabi. Um, Family Business Histories is therefore a, quite a special collaborative uh, project. So it's a private sector academic collaboration that really tries to engage um, a different type of audience uh, around the topic of family business histories. In more detail, the Family Business Histories is a project that works on compiling, documenting and analyzing the history, legacy and socioeconomic impact of family businesses in the GCC and Manasa region. But what does that actually mean? What do we do as a project? As a project, we are trying to understand the history of family businesses uh, in the regional uh, economy. And I think that's really the, the basis of our work. Then we are also looking to highlight legacies, um, legacies that often get forgotten, that get lost in, um, in, in um, different circumstances. We are trying to document them and preserve the heritage of those legacies um, for, for future generations. And of course, all of this is done with a view to the future. We are trying to compile information, get data sets that can influence and impact um, and inspire actually the future generations um, that are leading family businesses in our region. How can you interact with us? Um, you're most welcome to uh, follow our LinkedIn page, which has regular updates and insights based on our research as well as um, our sessions. Uh, and of course, our uh, Arabic and English uh, website, which has all the documents and the, the research that we publish as a project. Um, just a quick note for those of you who have perhaps not yet had the opportunity um, to, to download those. Our first three case studies are available um, for download, both in Arabic and in, in English, on our website. Um, I've realized I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Farida El Agami. I'm the general manager of the Sarawat Family Business Forum. And together with uh, Professor Martin Klimke from NYU Abu Dhabi, who is the co-director uh, of the um, Family Business Histories Project, uh, it's a great pleasure for us to welcome everyone here. Hi, Martin. Good to see you as usual. <laughs> welcome, everyone. Um, so now, uh, as to today's session, I think um, it will be a truly, truly fascinating session. And first of all, of course, uh, we'd like to welcome uh, our keynote speaker, Professor Paloma Fernandez, uh, who is a full professor in economic and business history at the University of Barcelona. And uh, Professor uh, Fernandez has a illustrious career in researching um, family businesses from a historical perspective. And she is joining us today um, to talk a little bit about family businesses um, in emerging and developing countries. And we will kind of have an interactive conversation with her after her introductory remarks uh, with regards to the, 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 the outcomes of her, her long-term research and what we can learn uh, from her perspective. Uh, Professor Paloma? Welcome. I hope she can hear us and see us. 
Uh, hello, Farida, I think that you need to, to allow me to start my video. Yes. Okay. Now. yes. okay. Yes. Hello, Thank Professor. <laughs> Great. Welcome Thank to you. our session, Professor. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, really a pleasure and an honor to have received this invitation from this very uh, enthusiastic, very powerful, and very creative uh, research group in the MENA region. I'm really proud of uh, ha having started a connection with you. Uh, my presentation today uh, will have to deal with the role of history in emerging and developed economies of the past. I'm going to share my presentation with you now. Uh, you can see Perfect. it? Yes, okay. yes, we can see it very well. Great. Uh, first of all, uh, the title is about uh, family businesses in emerging and developed economies uh, from a historical perspective uh, in order to try to highlight uh, some significant elements that uh, researchers, especially historians, have observed about different pathways and different opportunities in the past and for the future. Uh, first of all, uh, it's uh, very ambiguous and very difficult to define what a developed and what an emerging economy are, because these are, the, uh, as always in economy, uh, definitions change with time. That's one of the most important contributions by historians. Uh, theories, definitions, models cannot be ahistorical, they change. So developed and emerging economies uh, were words that started to be used in economy by consultants in the 1980s. Um, today have completely changed the classification of countries in them. Uh, 30 years ago, China was considered a very emerging economy with 12% annual growth uh, rates. Uh, today, China is no longer an emerging economy for many. It's a rather a developed economy. Spain uh, has been, uh, for most of its history, I'm a Spanish uh, citizen. Spain was, until the 1990s, considered an emerging economy, but now, uh, was changed and is considered a developed country. So the countries uh, enter and exit classifications very easily. However, there's something useful about concepts uh, beyond who is uh, in and who is out. And the usefulness of definitions is about uh, gaps in institutions, gaps in patterns of development, which even if the countries change, still the concept is useful to classify and analyze changing patterns of countries, changing patterns of regions, sectors, and businesses. History is therefore useful to see how the economy of countries and companies change in the past and today in the present. And it's useful also to see the legacy of the past where in different theoretical frameworks that uh, economists in Harvard, but also in the UK and Germany have been using in the last decades. So one of these uh, theoretical models that has been used to understand the past and how the past interacts with the economy is called the varieties of capitalism theoretical framework. Uh, you can easily uh, click in your smartphones and check the varieties of capitalism framework. You can see who started the ideas, but the key important issue is that varieties of capitalism classify uh, economies according to the level of coordination and the level of individualism and competition that can be found in broad regions of the world, but also in a styles of doing businesses. Again, this also changing through time. But the varieties of capitalism classify the world in some more cooperative economies or types of businesses, uh, South Korea, uh, Japan, Germany would be more cooperative. 
especially since the late 19th century and even today. Whereas in the other, the opposite side, in the varieties of capitalism theoretical framework, the most extreme example of individual economy, individual type of businesses would be the US, where the regulations, the institutions, the political game um, make businesses act and be performing in very individual competitive ways, very different to the ways that some other parts of the world uh, have. There, mixed hybrid types of uh, varieties of capitalism uh, in Latin America, in the Southern Mediterranean uh, side of Europe. I would say that in the MENA region also, there's a mixed type of capitalism where you can see a tradition of cooperation, especially in some sectors, but there's also increasingly in new sectors, more individualism and both coexist. Right, um, the state, the government has to uh, establish regulations that fit the cooperation in some sectors and industries and the high competition that exists in other industries and economic activities. So this would be a sort of inter, um, intermediate type of uh, variety of capitalism that I think works in the MENA region, in the south of the European Mediterranean countries, and also in some uh, Latin American economies like Mexico or Chile, where both things are also very much present since the mid 19th century, at least. The focus of this presentation is about uh, trying to understand how history impacts family businesses. And I have chosen to focus your attention in these words, concepts, or classifications. Uh, how family businesses have to perform, organize, or establish strategies when they are in countries or sectors where there's a dominance of developed institutions or high cooperative or high individual type of business organization. In depending on the context in which family businesses have to develop their strategies and their structures, they will develop different types of uh, evolutionary uh, strategies of growth and also different opportunities for growth and success. Family businesses, second, in this presentation, uh, we are very aware that many people say family businesses are so different. Uh, it's not the same Walmart, or it's not the same the families behind Aramco, the big oil company, right? It's not the same as the small shoemaker uh, in the corner of the street, the bread maker. They're so different, right? But both are family businesses. So, when history has to study family businesses, historians have to often realize that there's a cycle, like Charles Darwin, right? You have to imagine the evolutionary ideas of Darwin in biology. Many people in business have applied the Darwin's ideas in order to see change and transformation. Often family businesses start as very small, that's the most common trend in the world. There are exceptions, of course, but in general, family businesses start very small, uh, usually one, two, three members, micro family businesses, in fact. And if they're lucky, if they, or if they want, because sometimes it's not a question of being lucky, if they want to grow, because many small family businesses do not want to grow, they want to remain small. So if they can and if they want to grow, they can become middle-sized family businesses. Then their strategies, structures, their endowment, their requirements, their needs will be completely different. And again, if they can and if they want, often in their life cycle, many family businesses can transform and become big companies and even large business groups, very complex. The complexity can be so big that ownership is not 100% controlled by the family, 
that they can admit, as it is the case in many developed economies, they can admit other shareholders, outsiders from the family. And the management can also uh, include outsiders as professional CEOs taking care of the big business group. So there's a lot of diversity, a lot of diversity in size, in life expectancies, in a specialization of family firms in this complex outside the world of developed and emerging economies. Uh, here I'll show you just a few uh, uh, very simple images to show this diversity. First of all, uh, for 2005, before Lehman Brothers crisis, an image of a research I did in Barcelona, in Spain, about the longevity of the largest family businesses in a sample of 17 countries, uh, including those that at the time in 2005, I consider developed or emerging economies. I didn't have information from the MENA region, but I hope for my next project, I'll have. <laughs> so I can include countries from the MENA region. In this sample, you can see that the country where the oldest, largest family businesses can be found is Germany. And second, far from Germany with an average of 120 years, average age among the largest, largest defined by sales, right? So taking the rankings of the largest companies by sales in 2005, I saw that among them in those rankings, there were family businesses and the oldest ones had around 120 years average age. Uh, far from then, Switzerland and the UK and U USA were around 80 years in average. A middle group of countries included Italy, Brazil, India, Spain, Mexico, and very far from this middle group, China and Russia with the lowest average age uh, below 20 years in each country. This is a, a, an image of the sample of companies I took into account for this graph. Uh, for each country, except for Switzerland, I had around 20 large uh, companies in each of these countries. And you can see that there's a huge difference between the so-called emerging countries there, Russia and China at the time. You see Russia had less than seven years of uh, life the oldest family controlled businesses, Mexico around 50, Spain similar, and only later United Kingdom, as I said before, uh, Germany and Switzerland were below, uh, were above 80 years. There's a, a lot of companies uh, and the percentage from the sample is la, like I show here on the, uh, 30 and between 31 and 60 years average age were half of the sample. And you see that only 9% of the sample of companies I studied for my research had more than 120 years, which fits with current knowledge about uh, how long, long all companies can survive. You see that there are not many who are able to survive 120 years. Uh, in fact, this corresponds to around four generations. If we admit that one generation of a family is around 25 years, uh, a father that founds a company after 25, 30 years transmits uh, control of the company to the son. So that will be a change of generation. Only around 9% of my sample of very large companies in the world went through the fourth generation. So the common thing is to disappear. But the common thing is not to be very old, considering especially this sample where there's a lot of companies from developed economies. The size, considering sales in 2005 in the same sample of large old companies controlled by families, the US and Switzerland together and Germany had almost two thirds of the total sales of the sample which means that they're uh, not just old, the oldest ones in the world, but also apparently the largest in terms of uh, performance measured by sales. If you see India, 
if you see Brazil or Russia, in sales, they are below 3% each. Brazil is 3% of sales of the sample, India and Russia 2% each. Really very small. By specialization, uh, I have used international standard classification of economic activities because often we know in case studies that there are some sectors in which family businesses like to be, right? And especially when we study the origins, usually family businesses start in sectors where there are low entry barriers, right? Low entry barriers of capital, low entry barriers of information of markets, uh, low entry barriers of complexity involved in the organization when they start. At the end of the process, of course, if they follow a Darwinian cycle of growth, of course, the end big, large groups can be extremely diversified. In fact, most of the uh, family businesses in emerging countries are large, very diversified business groups. Okay, but taking together all the sample, you see what family businesses in general like to be, and most of them like to be in retail. And second, in primary products in the elaboration, manufacturing of very primary products, semi-elaborate, not very complex, initially not very financially requiring, like food or the repair of motor vehicles, wholesale trade. There's a second group of sectors, pharmaceuticals, electrical equipment, telecommunications, chemicals, metal products that are much more capital intensive, much more complex in the organization, much more demanding on knowledge of international markets, but these are well below the first sectors. You can easy, more easily see it in this graph where you see retail, how big <laughs> the ball is, right? And if you try to find the high intensive capital oil, chemicals, electricals and telecommunications, you will have a hard time to see where Wally is. <laughs> because Wally is a bit lost in this graph, but you can easily find retail again, motor vehicles repair. You travel, I don't, I don't know the MENA region. I like to travel and see it once, but I have traveled extensively in some countries of Asia and a lot in South America and Latin America. And I can swear, that in Latin America, if you travel with your car, you will see everywhere small workshops to repair your car, everywhere, with all sorts of wheels. So these motor vehicles and parts is so common, and they have been the origins of many large business groups in Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, Chile, Peru, um, in most of the uh, North American countries in Canada and the US. Also, I would say in Germany, in fact, most of the first car makers in France, Germany, not so much in the UK, but also were initially uh, individuals, entrepreneurs who were uh, specialized in repairing uh, bikes, bicycles. And from repairing bikes, they developed their expertise in the repair and uh, of motor vehicles and in components for them. Again, trade is the most common uh, specialty. There are big difference between developed and emerging economies. And as a sample with this same uh, project, I designed this graph where you can see the big difference in the big balls for the UK and India. Uh, in terms of sales, measured in millions of dollars. In the UK, after the Second World War, most of the big uh, capital intensive companies owned by families were sold to the US. Uh, the UK was destroyed by the war, the Second World War, London, Manchester, so many. And uh, many families after the war had lost their younger members. And many seniors didn't like didn't want to continue in the business. So they prefer to sell 
And so there was a big wave of sales in the 1950s of British capital intensive family owned companies to uh, North American companies. So that means that today, most of the British companies owned by families are not in the capital intensive, no lean intensive sectors, but they are in less capital, less knowledge intensive sectors, wholesale, food, repair, as one century ago. However, if you look at India, no worse, uh, young uh, leaders, uh, there's a strong support from the state. There has been no uh, dramatic, traumatic generational succession. You can see that there's a lot of investment of family businesses in capital intensive sectors like telecommunications, basic metals, and also oil refining. Compare the total sales of Indian oil refining sales with the British. It's 20 times more the Indian family businesses than the British family businesses in the oil refining sector. In fact, my guess is that possibly for the MENA region, the Indian uh, graph could have many similarities with the oil regions of the Middle East. There's also a focus for India, where you can see that just focusing on India, not comparing with other countries, there's a lot of intensity of uh, sectors that no longer are leading the interest of British families uh, that involve a lot of complexity, a lot of technology, a lot of global markets, very different expertise to the expertise required in today's British family businesses. This is an image for China uh, that corresponds to the evolution in the last 30 years of how uh, companies that started with a state support and state subsidies and a state bank support uh, have given this image with a lot of uh, basic metals, electrical equipment, motors, construction. There's a lot of diversification of families working in China in a number of sectors that are required by the Chinese government in order to develop major industries and help the growth of big cities and big industries. What have been the most common changes that all these family businesses uh, have uh, experienced in the last century. All of them uh, have lived in a context that apparently is similar. Uh, first, I have um, indicated five that I think are particularly relevant. One, uh, the expansion of the population uh, with the decline of mortality, with the rise of life expectancy, there has been a big expansion of the market measured by the expansion of the population, especially in big cities. And also they have uh, experienced big waves of technological revolutions that have increased productivity, while at the same time they have increased in many countries, not in all of them, but in many, most of them, they have increased as much productivity as inequality, which is a problem that politicians have to handle in order to prevent social unrest and, and social disorder. Uh, the consequences of the expansion of the markets and the expansion of the opportunities of productivity. Second, in most of these uh, uh, countries that I have analyzed uh, with a sample of family control businesses, there has been a big rise, then decline, and finally transformation of corporations from being large, very specialized industries and commercial uh, corporations. And now they are, many of them, fragmented, diversified, or they have a cooperation between big and small, especially in the US, in Germany, in Spain, in Italy, in France, Canada. The, we see that more traditional big family control corporations have alliances or acquisitions of small 
very innovative startups, especially in biomedicine, in telecommunications, in artificial intelligence. So no longer they are the factory owned by the father, founder of uh, the factory, but now today there's a complex continuation and growth of past factories. Now there are many centers, storage, uh, production, distribution, subsidiaries in the world, globalization. And this activity of searching very actively for startups or uh, very visionary entrepreneurs who have contact with very specialized high-tech markets uh, in order to add to traditional corporations new activities. Third, there has been a rise, decline, and transformation of global finances. In the past, the senior founders of family control companies uh, used to have little reliance on banks, if possible. They didn't like stock markets, except in the US, where it was easier and the risk of problems were minimized with the regulations. But in, except in the US, in most of the world, families didn't like banks and didn't like the stock markets. Uh, seniors uh, like reinvestment of profits. Families like uh, loans from other members of the family. Families and seniors like to attract more younger people of the family without paying them anything. <laughs> Maybe paying them the education, the university, a car, but not a salary, you just learn, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll send you to the UK, you will study, but no salary, no contract, but you will learn. So that was a way of adding more resources to the company, saving money, uh, in reducing the need to go to banks or stock markets. But this completely changed after the 1980s. With the big deregulation, there was a big bubble that exploded in the 1980s. And then again in 2008 with Lehman Brothers. The consequence of this big crisis of the financial markets has been uh, that many companies, first of all in emerging markets, first of all in emerging markets, more used the worst risk, problems, corruption, crazy governments. In emerging markets, especially Latin America, Southeast Asia, the MENA region, Africa, first there, they started to make groups where there was a central firm that was a bank or an insurance company or a financial services company inside the group. So they internalize the financial services that usually in developed economies, family, family businesses outsource in the market. Developed economies have been very late in realizing how smart emerging economies are. <laughs> uh, the developed world has needed Lehman Brothers. Well, first the big crisis of the 1980s and then Lehman Brothers to realize the need to go backward and be far from the risky markets and the need to have your own firm in which there's financial services to the rest of the group. Japan did that very early in the 1940s. In fact, earlier than that. In the first half of the 20th century, Saibatsu's family controlled Japanese groups already had their own bank. South Koreans learn from the Japanese. South Korea has imitated many things from Japan. After the 1960s in South Korea, they also realized how smart the Japanese were. And also they created diversified business groups with a bank or an insurance company. Japan and South Korea were the model for India and for China, even though they, they had political conflicts very embedded, but they liked their financial strategy. So family companies in India, in China, imitated the Japanese and the South Koreans. The MENA region, I don't know. I need to learn more from you because I don't know exactly how you did this transition in the change of global deregulation of finances. The fact of having your own uh, firm 
specialized in financing the rest of commercial and industrial activities help not just to reduce the interest rates of your investments and also to have long term uh, yeah, more longer terms to repay your debts, but also it allowed to enter more easily uh, and more directly and more flexibly and more quickly into opportunities of investment in global markets. The London stock market has been offering a lot of operations of merger and acquisitions to investors from all over the world, especially in the emerging markets. Families from China, families from the Arab world, families from Russia, families from Mexico, families from Spain have been rushing and hiring British uh, uh, persons involved in the London stock market brokers in order to know special opportunities to buy very quick, sell very quick and get small shares in a number of companies with high opportunities to enter, not just for business reasons, sometimes for legal reasons. One of the largest Hong Kong family control groups is the Li Kaching Group from Hong Kong. And he entered the Canadian and the US market, not just for entering the oil market in Canada or the telecommunications market in the US. He entered in the 1990s in those markets because uh, he needed to control all the American market, North and South, after NAFTA. NAFTA is a commercial alliance of Canada, US, and Mexico, 1994. And for a Chinese family company or Chinese whatever company, uh, regardless the type of ownership, for a Chinese company, it was impossible to enter unless you were Canadian, North American or Mexican. So many Chinese family businesses started to send their sons to study to Canada, where it was very easy to obtain visas for a study. And they were not the only ones. Arab countries have been doing the same, especially for the shipping industry and the harbor, the logistics industries. They have been sending many of their sons to Canada or to the US in order to get visas of study, which later help them to get uh, jobs, internships or, or real jobs and have uh, green cards. With the green cards, the sons of family companies from emerging countries had the opportunity to invest. They had the legal. So there have been a, a very interesting uh, um, transformation not just of global finances in the traditional way. So how the big players, banks, stock markets or business groups started to play, but how the family strategy of sending their sons in the world also started to change in order to invest in different ways. Fourth, there has been in the last century affecting very much family businesses, a transformation of what I call the feudal powers. Uh, we believe that the Middle Ages are back in time. And my impression is that not at all. Feudal times are very much alive. <laughs> and I think that there are many only looking at the TV news, we realize how alive feudalism, but feudalism in different ways that family firms have to adapt to. In the past, it was visible roads, locally based, and family businesses have to be loyal, obedient to the lords. But today, the lords are invisible, globally based powers that uh, usually are in finances, but not just in finances, in institutions that establish the regulations to enter in some sectors like biomedicine or artificial intelligence or aerospace strategies. And you have to be close to these invisible, globally based new feudal powers in order if you want to play in that league. And many big family business groups, especially in emerging powers, in emerging economies, they, are, they know how to play with feudal powers since all days, <laughs> since the days of the Quran or the Bible. Uh, families know how to play 
with feudal powers at the local level. And this expertise is helping them adapt to the global scope of the new feudal powers with which they have to deal with for their activities. And finally, as you will know, climate change and sustainable strategies are in the last centuries increasingly one of the key changes taking place in the outside world that family businesses have to adapt to. Uh, so this, the different impact of these changes in history have been different in developed uh, countries. Yes. Professor, I, just yes. Uh, to give you a note, uh, we have four more minutes to switch okay. to the conversation, I'll if that's go, okay. I'll go to the focus. Thank you so much, Farida. Uh, these are some of the impact of these external forces and the adaptation of companies owned by families. Volkswagen, L'Oreal in France, Unilever, Dutch and British, IBM in the US, Nokia, Scandinavians. They have managed to adapt to these five changes, changing the strategies of financing, but also the, their strategies of production, organization in the global markets. These are some of the top family controlled businesses today in seven developed countries. First of all, far from all the others, Walmart uh, in distribution, commercial distribution. And then far from them, uh, in car companies, chemical industries, Germany, uh, Walmart is a North American company. In emerging economies, uh, these are different issues that they have used to adapt to this common five elements of the external environment. One, more diverse, more adapted to high risk, more using seniority than in developed economies, using much more collective than individual entrepreneurship, and very creative in adapting to political turmoil and globalization from the Silk Road to the times of the Silk Belt in China today. These are some, there are many, but these are some of the ones I have been doing case studies in depth of their history. Hong Kong Center is one of the big ones, family control in Hong Kong. Reliance in India is one of the top ones in oil and telecommunications. Tata Motors is in India, car, but not just cars, very diversified too. America Mobiles is Mexican, the slim family behind very powerful, very important in all Latin America, in telephones and internet communications. Uh, this is some image of their sales. Uh, you see that the Indians and the Mexicans are leading the sample in which there were also Brazilian, Chinese and Russians. They do not appear in this graph because their sales are well below in the year 2005. Uh, these are some of the changes that I see in most recent times. Coexistence of seniors and juniors require a union. I think that that's one positive outcome of this new age of deglobalization. Uh, there's more inclusiveness of people traditionally outside or invisible, women and outsiders. There are new tools to adapt and adopt strategies from non-family businesses in family businesses. Uh, family businesses are very chameleonic. The opposite is not always true. Non-family businesses are reluctant to adopt strategies and tools from family businesses. I think that's very blind, <laughs> but that's what they do. Um, increasingly, there are new de-risk strategies applied to broaden networks at home. Emerging economies are very good traditionally to reduce risks, doing networking, family traditions, cultural traditions, religious traditions, and all these cultural family traditions are know-how that they're using and adapting to reduce risk today that they have to globalize. They know how to create networks, family, pseudo family networks with outsiders. Well, family businesses are very resilient for the, all these reasons, but I think that I would like to especially outline because they try when they're successful, ups, uh, 
to respect uh, the other generations, outsiders, uh, their clients, their suppliers, respect is a very important value in family businesses, traditional ones. Respect means sharing. Often families invite their clients, their suppliers at home. And that way they also share with outsiders, they share the hospitality. It's a way to build respect. And sharing and respecting helps build trust, and trust needs time. That's why often history here matters, because with history, with time, trust, tools, sharing strategies, and values of respect help the adaptation to a changing world. 50% of a family business is uh, their past. So they, are, they have the members and the outsiders working for family business you have to be aware of that in order to manage the resources endowment of family companies. And with that, I will finish. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Fernandez. This was a, a fascinating and very multifaceted talk. I'm sure there are a lot of questions, you know, about, you know, some of the concepts that you presented. Um, I want to kick it off and invite, you know, the audience to submit their questions, you know, through the Q&A box um, so that we have uh, a very rich, you know, 10, 12 minutes for discussions. But let me kick it off maybe with one question um, that we landed at at the end, uh, and that is the notion of resilience. Um, you know, that you uh, put forward uh, in the context of family businesses uh, facing complex external shifts, uh, you know, in many uh, sectors and areas. How would you define then resilience in the context of family businesses vis-a-vis um, -vis non family business? And, and how do you address, you know, the potential Western or ethnocentric lens, you know, of this particular concept? Yeah, I... Thank you, Martin. Uh, first of all, as a good historian, I would say that resilience must be defined in different ways, depending on the country and the moment in time in which, but generally, broadly speaking, of course, uh, is a measure of strength. There was a very famous Harvard professor, historian called Alfred Chandler Jr. Alfred Chandler was a member himself of a family company in the US, uh, the family business DuPont, one of the most important chemical family control businesses of the US. Uh, Alfred Chandler was one of the first business historians in Harvard in modern times. And he defined resilience as uh, longevity. Uh, uh, the number of years that the family is capable of recombining the resources, tangible and intangible, in order to endure. So on he, the most quantitative way of measuring or defining resilience will be how long, when did your company start it? So that's a measure, quantitative measure of resilience. A qualitative measure is also how long you manage to recombine businesses, whatever business it is, and family, whomever family is, <laughs> because sometimes as in Japan, family members are non-family members. You know that something law uh, with no blood relationship with a family are considered sons. So uh, resilience would be regardless who is in the family, and regardless, what's the economic activity of your business? How long you have managed to maintain both connected in time? And Pramodita Sharma, a woman of Indian ascendancy, one of the most well-known scholars in family business, she says that there's something called essence and there's something called components in a family business. And she says that the components are those things that may change and in fact, nothing will happen. The components can be the family members, today a son, tomorrow can be a daughter or a brother. So these are components. And components are also uh, the industry. Today can be a factory, but tomorrow can be a startup with South Koreans. 
<laughs> so these are components that may change, but the essence for Pramodita Sharma must be maintained. And the essence is the key to qualitative key. That's a qualitative key to define resilience in family business. When you manage to maintain your essence and the essence are your values. And often in family businesses, in many countries, the name, the reputation of a family name uh, contains the essence, right? So when you say a name that everybody in Spain, for instance, Grifols is a name of a very well-known pharmaceutical family, family, family business that managed to uh, invent products that were life-saving. And they are very strict, very serious. When people mention the name Grifols, you know that you mean seriousness, you mean loyalty, you mean uh, financial stability. Many German companies, in fact, they, they have the, this reputation, Martin, as you know. The, the essence of many German family businesses is to remain Mittelstand, right? Uh, Middle-sized, uh, very distant from fa fame and noise. The German Mittelstands, the essence is to be connected to the territory to the German institutions, a Mittelstand will always be loyal to their people. That's the essence of a German Mittelstand, right? So in every country, the essence will be different, but usually it's linked to a country, a region, or a name of a family and the mm -hmm. reputation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, so we have a couple of really interesting uh, questions, but we only have about seven minutes left. So I want to be very aware of time, um, but I do want to highlight kind of two partial questions that have come up. Um, and I'd love for you to kind of maybe comment on them uh, briefly. And then of course we can always take these questions offline and, and I'm very uh, grateful for them because I think they're very interesting. The first question I found very fascinating um, and very complex in its nature, maybe just a couple of words from your side. Um, one of our attendees was asking uh, in terms of authenticity, quality and value, is it better to remain a small business or expand it and, and become big. I think that's a, it's a dilemma, which you mentioned, right, as well, the Germans that kind of like to stay in that middle section. Um, and the second question, which is far more um, uh, specific in that sense, um, is from an attendee who's working on the history of family businesses in South Asia and the Indian Ocean, and is interested in her inheritance. And she was wondering if you noticed certain patterns in terms of legal structures that were uh, the most favorable for longevity in family businesses. So I don't know if, I know it's very difficult in four minutes to summarize your opinion on those two points, but maybe just a couple of keywords would be great. Thank you. Yeah, small or big, it depends. <laughs> uh, but if I were a consultant, I would say uh, the decision must try to maintain peace between generations and most try to maintain uh, the long-term vision of resilience of family essences. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would say as a consultant or as a family member, mm -hmm. you know, that I, I have a family business. So I am very aware that my son wants to grow very big. My husband uh, doesn't want to grow. He is 60. <laughs> <laughs> my husband is 60. He doesn't want to grow. He wants to have a nice retirement. But mm -hmm. my son is young. He wants to go to the US, register a patent, <laughs> invest, ask for loans. Oh, come on, come on. So in the end, it's something, a dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. So there must be a dialogue between the members who want to grow, the members who mm -hmm. want to remain small. And at the end of the decision, ideally, should try to maintain peace and mm -hmm. should try to have uh, what in the Middle Ages was this, the pacts, the negotiations. So mm -hmm. there's oh, there must always be a win-win. If only one wins, uh, there will be problems sooner or later. Yeah. yeah. Um, about the second issue, the legal forms for longevity, again, it all depends on where you live and when. Of course, Rockefeller, John Rockefeller, the founder before the 1890s, 
he loves to have one big corporation. But the Congress of the US decided that uh, big companies destroying competition were not acceptable in the democratic system of the US. So they destroyed the longevity of <laughs> the Standard Oil owned by John Rockefeller. And he was forced to split in more than 20 different companies. So new companies appear, the old one stopped their longevity. So in order to maintain your longevity, ideally, you have to be uh, flexible enough to not be affected as much as you can by big changes in legislation. So something uh, low level, like the German meter stance, I would say, mm -hmm. try to keep a, a low level. If, if, you be, if you are very visible, doing very revolutionary things, uh, you can do them in the US, but also you can lose a lot. Uh, if you want to maintain and be resilient, legally also you have to keep a low profile mm -hmm. and have very, very standard regulatory profile that can be adapted. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. why business groups are good. That's mm -hmm. uh, possibly, and that's not a legal form. Business groups are not legal forms, but they mm -hmm. are the dominant way family groups are organized. One thing is organization, another thing is legal form. So business groups are composed of independent firms, mm -hmm. but they all obey to one or two uh, companies where mm -hmm. there's a majority shareholder. Mm -hmm. So sometimes families are very good in establishing things that allow them to survive despite the legislation. The Rothschilds are also a good example how they mm -hmm. manage to do internationalization because you can obey the law of one country, but if the law of one country is not good for your family, you can travel across the border, right? That's what many families do. Mm -hmm. So you establish mm -hmm. subsidiaries, you change. Bunge in, American, in Latin America did it, the Rothschilds did it in the Second World War, and many mm -hmm. companies have done it in, in Europe in the Second World War. Thank you very much. Martin, any final words from your side? No, thank you so much. I think there's a lot more to discuss, obviously, and thanks so much for opening that picture. I think any and all of the points that you raised would require their own seminar, their own lecture series, obviously, and you were very, very exactly. thankful you know, for you uh, to be with us. Uh, your body of work, the volumes of work that you have produced over the decades now, the scholarship speaks for itself, and we're happy to provide you know, further guides for further reading uh, on that front to our audience. But thanks so much for being with us, uh, Professor Fernandez, today. And also from my side, and I can see we still have so many questions that are coming in. Um, we could spend another two hours, I think, together easily, uh, Professor, because you've literally just given us a, a taster of, you know, all the all the complex uh, points that you have evaluated in your research. Um, what I take away is that kind of a, a new filter, perhaps, or a new lens with which looking at family businesses, which is a multi-factor lens, both external and internal factors that really play together in our decision making, you know, as entrepreneurs, how do we make sure that in a more and more complex world nowadays, how do we take those decisions? How do we take our companies forward? And I think your model or the, the elements that you have studied really kind of merge very beautifully into a, a new perspective, a new model really with how we can look at family business leadership uh, and ownership who are so essential, right, for all these economies that they exist in. And that is really why we are passionate as well about family firms because of their macroeconomic importance and impact. Uh, and so once again, thank you very much. We are very honored that you've spent this time with us. I'd like to thank our audience who's been extremely diligent and, and asking amazing questions. Uh, we hope, of course, to continue this dialogue with Professor uh, Paloma whenever we can, and we hope to see you there again. Um, but for now, until the next time, we wish you a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.